Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And I was given one instruction, don't step over the three-point line. I'm living on the edge. OK. Um, I, my, my daughter, Emma, just graduated. And I realized that you're, you've got finals and papers due, and that graduation is in how long from now? Two weeks? Less than two weeks? This may be the un most unteachable moment in your life. And that's the chapel I was given. And it's, it's kind of like teaching uh, the week before Christmas vacation when you still believe in Santa Claus. <clears throat> Probably a tough job. Um, I'm going to show a, a film clip, and I'll tell you what it's about. I, I made a uh, set of films. The guys who made the NUMA films with Rob Bell asked me to make these. And we wanted to uh, talk about um, stewardship in the Bible. And uh, we introduced these last this past month, and we had um, a worship service using electronics, a kind of a simulcast thing. We had about 2,000 churches and groups in 45 countries, and we watched uh, part of these. Um, can you flip that up, and, and then I'll, I think it speaks for itself. Taking care of the planet is a form of giving. Jesus said that the most important kind of giving isn't the kind that seeks recognition. It's about helping people that can't even thank you. It's about sacrifice. It's about planting seeds for the future. We're told to be the hands and feet of God on the planet, the stewards of the planet. And if you believe in an all-powerful God, maybe you should ask yourself this question. Why was I born here? Why wasn't I just born in heaven? God placed us here because he wants us to choose him. This is a love story. This life, this time, it's a gift. It's my prayer that when you're surrounded by mystery and uncertainty, your eyes look up to the bright morning star. It's my prayer that you love your neighbors. No, it's not anything more than that by caring for this planet. If you do, it will be very, very good. Day's already come and gone, so that part needs to be cut. Um, I've left a set of the films uh, with with the school, and they're available to you. And I, I just want to, in this moment that's very unteachable, <laughs> try to tell you why why it is that it is important that you were born here and that you weren't born in heaven, and and maybe um, let let you know how I made that journey, and and you can apply what applies to your life. Um, I, it's, it's, um, I was not, if you back up in my life 10 years ago, I was not a Christian. Um, and uh, I was an ER doctor, and I was really good at being an ER doctor. I like it a lot, and I don't get a chance to practice medicine anymore. So if during this talk anybody wants to fall unconscious, it'd make me really happy. Because <laughs> I'll try to resuscitate you. And, um, and I was just going along in life, and um, I have uh, one wife, uh, Nancy, and one daughter, uh, Emma, and one son, Clark. And um, we uh, lived on the coast of Maine, and we went off uh, for vacation uh, during the winter. You don't have snow here. This is sickening. The weather here is so wonderful. Every time I come here, it's the same. Um, perfect. <laughs> uh, 
but in New Hampshire and in Maine and Vermont, it's anybody from there? Yeah. Cold winters, right? February, get away. Um, and we went and we stayed on an island in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, uh, we, my, my, my kids ran around all day. And my daughter found out about this. Actually, where are you, Emma? You found about it from listening to a sermon on Mars Hill, right? Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, my kids wouldn't go to sleep. So I did what your parents might have done once. I dimetapped the kids. I suspect, no, never mind. <clears throat> it's where little brothers and sisters come from. But anyways, the, 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 the kids went to sleep, and my wife and I were sitting outside, and there's this beautiful breeze, and stars spread out overhead. And my wife, who's not a Christian, and me, who's not a Christian, my wife was raised as a Jew. Um, my wife turns to me and she asks me this question, which is, what's the biggest problem in the world? Now, I don't know about you, but God doesn't show up at the end of my bed and talk to me. As a matter of fact, I'm going to sidebar for a second. We're going to take like 90 seconds, and I want you to buddy up with a few people around you, and I want you to real quick say, how does God talk to you? This is for real. Do it now. I'm going to ask some of you, okay? Do it real quick. How does God talk to you? All right, I am so far out of the three-point line, it's not even funny here. Okay, how's God talk to you? He speaks to you through other people, which is where I was going with this, because God speaks to us through our lives, and, and this time it was my wife. In, in, that can happen anytime. You, Holy Spirit, resonates with you. Think fast, you're in college. Through the trees. Through the trees. Bless you. Okay. <laughs> I'll get back to that. Over here. Yeah. In prayer. Through songs. We did that, yeah, this morning. And uh, Todd was talking about that. The Bible. Yeah, scripture. Absolutely. This is a fast crowd. I like this. Through other scripture, other people. So, anybody had God show up at the bottom of the bed? Uh-oh, got to get back in the three-point line. No, okay, so it's probably going to happen to you the way it happened to me and these other people here. That's how God's going to speak to you, through the, through the Bible, through the tree, through prayer, through Scripture. And in this case, that was a question from God, I'm sure. I answered it that the world is dying. What's the biggest problem in the world? The world is dying. In my lifetime, no chestnuts on Chestnut Street, no elms on Elm Street, no caribou in Caribou, Maine. I can go on and on and on. It's depressing, and so I won't go on. Um, but I haven't met anyone who thinks that we can continue building, paving, growing, extincting things at the rate that we're doing now, and that in 100 years, which is a normal lifespan almost these days, that things are going to turn out OK. The question for the church. The question for the people um, of God and the question for me that my wife asked next was, what are you going to do about it? I didn't know. 
I, I came back to my job, and it's a lovely job. What's wrong with emergency medicine? There's nothing wrong with it. You're doing good work. Everybody thinks it's good work. They make TV shows about it, right? Have you ever seen a TV show called Prevention, though? It's not exciting work. Um, and so um, what, what happened was that I went looking for answers. And I lived in a secular world. I grew up in that world. I, I, I grew up thinking that, that that logic had the answers to everything. And I went looking elsewhere. And I read through other kind of sacred texts. And I'm probably the only person you know that came to Christ. Uh, here's how it happened. I walked into a waiting room in a hospital. There was a coffee table full of books and magazines. There was an orange book on it. I looked at it and I said, oh, that's a Bible. I don't have one of those at home. I've never read it before. So I stole it. <laughs> Anybody else know somebody who stole a Bible? Well, it's, it turns out it's a trap. It was Gideon's Bible. But I read through the Gospels. And the Bible is the only book that you should start two-thirds of the way through if you're reading it for the first time. And I read through the Gospels and I was profoundly confronted by Christ. That's all it takes is the Gospels. And, um, and it and it changed my life, and it began to change the way I thought about everything. And um, it began to, to direct my life. And I realized that, that Christ um, was, was the example of everything. Um, eventually, the good news is that my son read that Bible, and then my, my wife and my daughter, we all became followers of Christ. Now we're on the same page together. And eventually, I went back to my wife, and I said, well, <clears throat> The earth is in trouble, um, and um, we ought to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Why don't we sell our house, give like half of our stuff away, and um, I'll quit my job, and we will um, we'll try to figure out what God wants us to do. What do you think you would do if your father came home and said something like that? It's kind of a lunatic thing, right? You were really happy, right, Emma? Yeah. She's a good daughter. <laughs> but that's what we did. And it's my, um, what I get to tell people, and I get to talk to non-Christians all the time because they want to hear about this stuff. What I tell them is that actually Jesus will mess up your life. He'll complicate it. That's real, authentic religion. It's not easy. It's not, it's not simple. Um, we started going, when we made this change, we moved from our doctor-sized house to a house the size of our garage feel sorry for me? You ever seen a doctor's garage? It's huge. Um, and um, we started going to church, and um, everything in my life changed. The books I was reading, the movies I was watching, the ways I was thinking about things, the ways I related to my kids, my wife, everything was changing. That's Christianity. It'll change everything. And we went to church, and somebody came up to me, and I'm doing green stuff, I'm trying to figure out what the Bible says about it. And somebody came up to me and he says, you know, you, your theology is really screwy because you have tree hugger theology. And what I thought was, maybe he's right. Maybe my theology is too weird or liberal or green or something. The great news is that our faith is not based upon a fad. Our faith is anchored in a Bible, and the Bible doesn't change. And so I would invite you, if there's ever a conflict between you and your church or, or whatever, go to the Bible. It'll give you the answers. So that's what I did. I went and I read through the whole Bible, and I underlined things that had to do with God tasking us to take care of the planet. Now, <clears throat> uh, I was told this morning by a lovely person I trust that <laughs> don't to do, do the tree sermon because it takes too long. And the short version doesn't work. I'm going to do it anyways. I love you, Emma. Okay. How have you, any of you have had a sermon on trees? Raise your hand. Well, what I want you um, to think is, why haven't you had a sermon on trees? And I'll tell you why. If you open up your Bible, a tree shows up on the first page. If you flip to the last page of your Bible, there's a tree there. It's the tree of life. There's a tree of life at the beginning of everything, and there's a tree at the end in heaven. And if something is an alpha and omega, and a first and a last in the Bible, it's really important. 
This is one of the most profound symbols in the Bible. Um, I don't know whether Peter wore skinny jeans or not. I don't know whether Paul had a faux hawk. I don't know whether Deborah dyed her hair. I know what species of tree Zacchaeus was in when he was eight. I know what species of tree Nathaniel was in when he was seen by Christ and called to discipleship. If there is a vine, a tree, a stick, a bush on the page, it is a gigantic symbol in the Bible and something big is happening. A tree is the first aesthetic assigned in the Bible. It's the first thing that just says God likes the looks of it. And if you trace those trees and sticks and bushes through the Bible, it's a story and it punctuates the Bible. The first psalm begins by saying that a righteous person is like a tree. But for the Christian, what's the big news of the Bible? Christ. Christ, who is God, taken on the form of a little baby, sets up shop in a barn the first night and goes through his ministry and, and, and he dies on a tree. This is not by accident. It's foretold in the Old Testament. Is there a physical description of Christ in the Bible? Bible trivia question. Anybody know? There is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I hate it when that happens to me and I'm speaking and it's on. But I don't have a cell phone on me at the moment. Um, Isaiah 53 describes Christ as a little green plant. Go look it up later. And it, what it's saying is we don't pay attention to little green things like we're supposed to. He had no looks, no comeliness that would attract us. He was like a tender plant. So Christ goes through this life and he lives and he dies on a tree, and he is buried. And three days later, Mary goes down to his tomb. This is a very important symbol I'm coming up on here. Her eyes are red. She probably has been crying for three days straight. If any of you have lost family members, imagine what that feels like. You just cry for days. And she goes down, and the tomb is empty. And she turns around, and there is Christ, but she gets his identity wrong. What does she mistake him for? A gardener. Yes, absolutely. This is not a mistake. We were put here on this planet to take care of it. The, the commandment in Genesis 2.15 to humanity is to protect and serve the garden. And that's what I found in the Bible. I didn't find that it's a disposable planet. The Bible says don't pollute the waters. Don't clear-cut forest. In Revelation, it says, I will come back and destroy the destroyers of this earth. I promise you that our theology is about taking care of this planet. And that's what I found in the Bible. And that's what I urge you in this very short period of time, this unteachable moment, uh, to do. And I think it's very vital. Now, you get to pick. Do you want me to act out the Good Samaritan story? Or do you want me to tell you about literally stabbing somebody in the chest? Because I've stabbed somebody. You get to decide which one. <laughs> They're both stabbing somebody. Okay. Everybody for stabbing? Has anyone here? Okay. Has anyone here personally ever stabbed somebody? I want you to see the admissions counselor if you have. Okay. Well, here's how I got to stab somebody. I was working in the ER. And I went in early for a shift, because I remember, because I was dressed in a suit. And you don't normally wear a suit in the ER. You get to wear pajamas. It's the only job where they pay you that's a legitimate job, big money, to wear pajamas to work. I love it. So, but I'm not in my pajamas. I'm dressed like this. And the ER is like a zoo. And one of the nurses comes over and says, back to sleep, there's a guy here and he's not doing so well, and I know you're not on, on yet, but everybody's busy. Is there any possibility you could see this guy? And I said, sure, because I love this stuff. So <clears throat> I go over, and they put this guy in the room with the Donald Duck and everything. You know the room where they put the kids? that has like the big cartoons? It's, it's the kid room. 
you can't have anything in that room. Why? Because little snot-nosed kids are always looking for stuff in the drawers. So there's nothing in that room but balloons and stickers and that sort of thing. So that's where they've got the guy. And what had happened is he'd fallen earlier in the day just a very short distance, and he'd landed on his side. And as the day went along, he was having a harder and harder time breathing. So they brought him in, and I'm listening to this guy, and I remember, you know, he grabbed my arm and he said, don't let me die. That gets your attention. And um, so I'm listening, and the guy's what we call in the ER crumping. His, like, his blood pressure is going down, pulse is going and everything, and he's kind of sliding out of it. And what I think that he's got is called attention pneumothorax. And that's where the lung has kind of collapsed and it's leaking air around the space of the lung and it's, and it's going under pressure and it'll actually collapse the, not only the lungs, but it'll collapse the heart. And so you can't get any blood back. And um, anybody here watch Lost, a Lost Junkie? They do this in the first episode. It's not very common, but of course it's dramatic. And, and so what you got to do is you got to uninflate that balloon that's basically blowing up. But they've got the kid in this, they've got him in the, in the kid's room, and there's no tools there. And everybody's busy, and they can't find me anesthesia to numb him up and everything. And you're supposed to put a chest tube in, which is like a garden hose-sized tube in the lung. And um, so eventually I said, just get me a scalpel. And as he's going down, I stab him in the side of the chest. And I like get the scalpel through and get my fingers in. I love this stuff. And, and there's blood and air that blows up all over the place. So much for my suit. And he begins to get blood and oxygen and everything back to his, his heart and his lungs and then back to his brains and realize that there's a guy with his fingers inside of him who's just stabbed him, and now they've got me the garden hose, the chest tube, that I'm shoving inside his chest. And he begins to give me a look, you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing to me? And so then I gave him this drug called Versed, which gives you amnesia. Okay. <laughs> so what is the point of this story? How does this fit into the environment? This is another thing. Just like God speaks to us through our wives and through trees and through um, these unique experiences that you're, you're going to have in life, um, God speaks to us through the work that we do. God's always preparing us for something down the road. And God, I believe, was preparing me through the practice of emergency medicine, through stabbing people, to learn certain principles that apply to stewardship. And these, these are some of the principles. Number one, you, people die. Bad stuff happens, and you learn that in emergency medicine. S bad stuff happens. There are real consequences to polluting a river, to polluting the air. People die from it eventually. Um, number, number two, you, you cannot always have all the facts at your disposal. We are going to be asked to make some big decisions, and you're not going to have everything. I didn't have a CAT scan on the guy. That's what you really need. Imagine if I stabbed him in the chest and I got the diagnosis wrong. It looks bad. I would have had to give me Versed. Um, and, and you've got to go ahead and, and act. And that's, that's what I'm trying to, uh, to teach here. That, that right now things are bad with the environment. You can ignore it. You could give the guy an aspirin. like I could have given him an aspirin. That's not enough. Or you can really take this to heart and say, we were put here on this planet to take care of the planet. People want to know what Christians are for, not what we're against all the time. And we're for loving our neighbors and loving God. And loving God means the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to the earth. This is the 21st Psalm. And that we should take that to heart and take it seriously. Now I have a few minutes left, and I am going to do the Good Samaritan. Is there anybody here that's going to be a youth pastor? No one? Where? Come forward. Walk across the water. There you go. Yes.
Hi. What's your name? John. John. That's a good name. John, come up here. We, we're supposed to stay inside the three-point line. <clears throat> uh, John, you're familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay. Um, I want you to play the part of the mug guy. Mug guy? Yeah. All you got to do is um, get mugged and naked. No. Okay. Um, all you, if you could just like lay down here and pretend to be mugged. John, that's great. You're, you're, a good, you're a good sport, okay? Okay. Here's your part. You just go, uh, okay. Jesus is asked, how do I get to heaven? Okay? How do I get to heaven? That's a good question. And he gives this illustration that there was a certain man going down uh, uh, from uh, Jerusalem to Galilee and that he fell among strangers, and they robbed him, and they stripped him, and they took, you got a cell phone on you? Yeah. No, okay. They took a cell phone, they, they took all his clothes and everything, and this the whole point of this story is, how do I get to heaven? Am I running late? I'll speed the mugging up here. Okay, so pay attention here. Along comes the first person, and passes by, and they hear that. Many, many of us are like the first person Christ illustrates who just passes by. He doesn't stop. He doesn't do anything. You feel any better, John? No. Okay. Along comes the second person. Remember, we're supposed to pick out how, who we're going to be like so we can get to heaven. Along comes the second person, and that's just getting better. you got a future in Hollywood, which isn't too far from here, I hear. Um, you feel any better, though? Well, if you read the story carefully, there's something different about the first and the second person. Um, Christ is, is, is using an Aramaic storytelling technique, and things always come in triplets, and you always ramp up the action. You give him one talent, five talents, ten talents. You, you. What happens, I think, is Christ is trying to illustrate, is that the first person just passes by. That's the person who says, nothing wrong. I don't even see it. The second person crosses the road. That's where most of us live with these problems, whether it's, whether it's childhood slavery or, or, or not having water or, or polluting water. Most of us live saying, wow, oh, they crossed the road. There's something wrong here. This poor guy, John, has been mugged. I'll get home and blog about this. That will fix it, but you're not feeling better, right? We're supposed to be like the Samaritan. The Samaritan comes along and he's riding a donkey, right? He's got money. This is the first person. It's dangerous you, you, in this territory. Obviously, you've got money. John, you shouldn't have been here. Um, but he's, uh, he's got money. He, he sees the problem. His heart's moved to compassion. He gets down, and he begins to bandage John up and to wash his wounds with the wine and the oil. What's that wine and oil? That's his wares. He's using his money. And he takes this person and puts them on the donkey and takes them to the equivalent of a hospital and he pays the bill for them. I saw 30,000 patients as an ER doctor. One time, someone paid the bill for a stranger. We are probably not as generous of people as we think, is the moral. But did it get my attention? It sure did. And so, John, the end of the, can Emma cover your ears, honey? The moral of the story is, see, she's doing it. If you want to be a good Samaritan, the first thing you have to do is get off your ass. Okay? So, <laughs> end of story. Okay. John, thank you so much. And we're, we're done. I was told absolutely to end now. I want everybody to stand up, hold your neighbor's hand, and John and I are going to say the Lord's Prayer with you. Yeah. Lord, thank you for giving this prayer and teaching us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.